Good morning, Facebook world. My name is Kara, and I'm one of the co-owners of Des Moines Mom. And today we have with us uh, Vicki Wieben. She is a licensed independent social worker, as well as a registered play therapist. Um, additionally, she is the owner and supervisor of Bright Light Counseling, which is in Johnston. And we are embarking on our second segment of uh, Mental Health Mondays. And so we are going to be talking about today our children and behaviors. We have titled this, Is This Normal? Because sometimes your children are doing things and you're like, I don't think you should be doing that. But Vicki is here to tell us whether or not these types of things we can expect and are completely fine or when we should look into seeking additional help. So uh, Vicki, we are just going to hop right in today. So, okay. Tell me a little bit about like child development and, you know, there's these different stages of regulation and dysregulation and, you know, these kids are getting older and growing and their brains are, you know, hopefully developing more, but tell me about some of these stages and things that we should like be seeing and think, oh, okay, that's normal. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the most enlightening things that I have learned um, that have helped me, that has helped me as a parent, I have two little ones, and as a counselor is the fact that in order for our brains to create regulation and grow, there has to be a period of dysregulation. And so our children turn three, right? And maybe, and I, I hear this a lot and I feel this a lot with my own kids. Okay. You know, so my daughter's five, my daughter's five and gosh, things have been so easy since she turned five. And then maybe you check in with me in like six months and I'll be like, I don't know what's happening. Everything's a mess, you know, everything like big emotions and everything's a problem. Right. And so I used to think, especially during that time, like something must be wrong. I, as a parent must be doing something wrong. She must be, you know, getting some, like, maybe she's getting made fun of at school or maybe this is happening or this is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one of the most enlightening things that I had ever have ever read and have just like clung to for life is the fact that in development, there has to be this period of dysregulation in order for them to grow. And so, um, and so I always think about that, even when people begin to think about like, maybe, maybe our child should see a therapist. Mm -hmm. I always think about, okay, well, let me teach you this first mm -hmm. and let's see kind of what's normal and then what's beyond what's probably like typically developing uh, typically developing normal. Can you unpack a little bit your, the terms of like regulation versus yeah. dysregulation? Yes. Yeah. So regulation is kind of like when everything's going well. So I think of regulation as my child's eating everything that I put on her plate, <laughs> or she is putting on her shoes when I ask her to. Um, she, is, you know, my son is turning off the video games when I ask him to, or doing his chores. That's like regulation. So regulation, um, we think of it as like when I'm working with on regulation with kids, uh, we kind of use colors. Mm -hmm. So I use green for regulation, and that's kind mm -hmm. of right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then red is for dysregulation and red dysregulation is more of like a hyperactive. So it can be anger, but it can also just be trying to transition from going inside, uh, from outside to inside, you know, when your body is just kind of revved up. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's another color for dysregulation, which is blue, and that's located kind of on the other side of the green. So you're thinking about sort of a, a circle, green's in the middle, red's here, and then blue. And blue is when um, like early morning when your kids don't want to get out of bed, it's time for school, or they, you know, they don't want to um, move from their video game. So it's more of like a slow, just not really wanting to, to move <laughs> is what blue is. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, say that you're nor you are noticing some of these times of dysregulation um, and maybe you feel like you are having more dysregulation in your children than what you might think is normal yeah. what what ways can either we ask somebody that we trust or see if you think you know my children my child might need some additional um help or you know how can i help my child too yeah i think that this is where um community is so important yeah. So my go-to thing is to ask other parents of kids that have kids my age or older. Mm -hmm. So I have some friends who have kids that are right around the, the age of my kids. And then I have some parents who are, or some friends who are parents of kids who are older. 
and I'll immediately usually go to them and say, so this is happening in my house. What, what is this like? Mm -hmm. And um, most of the time, uh, like you'll get the, oh yeah, that from the old, from the parents of older kids, they'll say, oh yeah, I remember that they'll grow out of it. Um, or from parents that are dealing with kids who have like are the same age as mine, they'll be like, yeah, like, what are we, like, what, what is that even about? Mm -hmm. And I think that when, I think having that community and just that ability to check in with other moms and say, hey, is this normal? And then to hear like, yeah, that's normal. Like then I can just relax and let them be that way, right? Like there's a little bit of relaxation I can have in, okay, this is just normal development. This is just what they're doing. Um, so I think that having that community is so important um, mm -hmm. just so that you can always have somebody to check in with. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that makes, that makes sense. I think as parents, you know, we help, we want to be able to help our children and to help them, you know, identify and process and kind of deal with their emotions. But sometimes, you know, there's, we just don't know what to do. So when do we like say, okay, maybe we need to talk to somebody who is a professional and we need to get outside help. Yeah, well, I think it can be a couple of things because even if the behavior itself is, is normal and maybe other parents have gone through the same thing with their kids, but it's still really disrupting right. your family life or your family mm -hmm. dynamic, then it might be time to come in and just kind of have somebody um, a professional, just look at the situation and give some tips and, and some ideas, some coping strategies. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of teaching kids how to manage these big emotions that come in. So even though it's normal for kids to have really big emotions, um, they still have to learn how to deal with them. They still have to learn how to, how to manage those big emotions. And sometimes parents have to learn how to teach their kids to manage those emotions. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I notice about kids is like, um, they just look so capable. Like I, I have a story about um, my son when, he's in, when he was in kindergarten, um, he was not putting his papers in his folder he was just shoving everything into his backpack. And I remember complaining to a friend about that and just saying like all of his papers come home crinkled and you know, he's in kindergarten now. So he should know how to put that, put those papers in his folder, like talking about it, like this is so easy. And my friend was kind of like, whoa, back up. Like he's never had to do that before. So that's a skill he doesn't have. And so I kind of had to back up and actually like we went through like, this is how you put your papers in the folder, right? And then you put the folder in the backpack. And after we went through that lesson, we had very few problems with it after that. And so I think that, that our kids from the outside look so capable that we forget that some of these very basic everyday things that we do to manage our emotions or to get through the day are, like are things that, that have to be taught. Yeah, it's true. Like I think about that in my own family's life and it's just like, especially, you know, my older son and my younger daughter, I'm like, well, Lucan can do that. Why can't you do that? It's like, well, because you know, you're three and a half years younger than your brother and nobody has taught you that. Yeah. Oh, right. I could, I could probably help you with that. Yes. And I think there's also times too, where you're you know, comparing your children and, you know, you think, okay, well you did this, so you should do this too. And, you know, it's not an apple sapples scenario. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we have to like, be like, okay, these are different people. They have, you know, different personalities. They have things that they're good at and things that they're bad at. And that's perfectly fine. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's one of the hardest thing that, things about siblings in particular is mm -hmm. you have one sibling who can do something in particular and then one who maybe is, is not doing it as well. And you think they came from the same mother and father. So why, why is there so different? And you're absolutely right. Like these are two mm -hmm. different humans with two different stories and, and two sets of different needs. Yes. Yep. Oh, all of, all of that is just excellent. And Great points. Okay. So we've talked a lot about, you know, child development, regulation versus dysregulation, how we as parents have a role to play and how we can help. Um, but, you know, maybe we've gotten to that point where, you know, we as adults have, a no have noticed these things that we think are red flags 
And maybe, you know, we've had other adults say, you know, or like a teacher, you know, say maybe this is something that you want to address. How do you find a therapist for your child? Yeah, yeah. I think that that can be hard because, um, you know, I think just like doctors or just like any other kind of professional that you're going to go to, even, mm -hmm. even people that you'd invite in your home to work on things, like everybody has different values, different yeah. Um, different things that they that they um, sort of specialize in. Mm -hmm. Everybody has different personality types. And so I would say that, um, and I think this was said in the Mental Health Monday last time, and I would echo that, that check in with somebody that you trust. You know, do you know of anybody that, that um, do you know of a therapist or do you know of somebody that I could take my child to, um, to see? And that's going to be like that word of mouth is probably the best um, the best uh, recommendation that you can get because mm -hmm. it's from somebody that you specifically trust. Right. Um, a couple other options would be like you can do 211, which is like the information. Uh, it's oh. run by the United Way. So you can do 211 and they could tell you, give you kind of a list of, mm -hmm. of these are therapists who are in your area. Um, Psychology Today has a website with a list of therapists that they like, so therapists have, they'll like um, put their picture on there and then a bio, these are the things I'm interested in, these are the things that I, that I work with, um, and that can be a really good way to kind of weed out, this is what this looks like too. Okay, yeah. um, you know, something, I said that you are a registered play therapist, but I actually have no idea what that means. Can you tell me a little bit about like your practice and what you do there? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, when you graduate with, with your degree and you're able to jump into therapy, um, for the most part, people are trained, therapists are trained as generalists. So there's mm -hmm. kind of just this general, here's, here's the theories and the foundations of therapy. Um, and you kind of then, as you're in the field, you start to see like, oh, these are the things that, that um, are sort of a niche for me, something I'm interested in, something I, I enjoy doing, something I'm passionate about. Um, and so that's sort of where you find, you find some counselors who are sort of passionate about marriage counseling or yeah. who are passionate about working with women or, or moms, you know, those sorts of things. And, um, and so in my practice specifically, um, I work a lot with kids and families and that's really where my passion is. And so a registered play therapist is somebody who has gone through some extra training and clinical work in order to receive a certificate um, that, that says like, basically, you know, I've gone through these, uh, I've jumped through these hoops in order to specialize specifically in children and families and play in my therapy. So when I am working with kids, play is sort of their natural form of communication. Um, and so that's basically, that's what we're going to be doing when we come in here, we're going to, we're going to play uh, and, and I've been able to be trained to sort of learn how to watch that play or, you know, particularly um, direct some play in order to get to the information that I, that I want or need in order to teach them. Okay. With play therapy, do, like, is there a point, like, or stage or age where kids kind of age out of that? Or is that something that can be taken, I don't know, for how long? Yeah. Yes and no. I think that, um, you know, kids are, kids always play, even teenagers. If you can get past the, I don't play stage, like you can, you know, <laughs> that they would play a lot of art. I think as you get older, it turns into a, a lot more art or a craft kind of things more than just with toys. Um, but I think having a playful approach with even adults can be a really good way just to connect, mm -hmm. um, and sort of help people let their guard down when they come in. So okay. um, I would say play sort of uh, is, a, is a foundation for a lot of what I do okay. in this space. Interesting. Um, is there like a typical, I, I feel like that's, pro I'm probably going to answer my own question, but is there like a typical age that you would recommend like start or like considering therapy maybe for your kiddo? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I would say, so typically if I get, um, I see kids as young as two, three, four, okay. and I will only see them with their parents. So okay. that's a, that would be sort of a dyad uh, clinical work in which we'd be working with parent and child. Mm -hmm. um, but as kids get older, especially as they start to enter school, 
mm -hmm. um, kindergarten, first grade. So like that five, six, seven, that's usually when some of some things start to come out or parents start to yeah. hear, you know, cause your kids are now leaving your home and going into the school setting and they right. might be hearing from teachers. This is what's happening. I'm not sure about that, you know? And so then mm -hmm. I have, we'll have parents come in and say like, okay, so this is what I'm hearing. This is what the school's seeing. Can we just sort of look at this and see what's going on? So I would say that's usually, um, and typically for most therapists, they'll start seeing kids around the age of five or six. Okay. No, yeah. that that is very, very helpful. Okay. I have a follow-up question. What would kind of a session, like a typical session look like with yeah. a kiddo that's, you know, five, six, seven? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a typical session would look like typically I will bring the parent in and we'll just give a quick update. We'll talk about what's been happening over the last week. And I try to include the kid as, in that, the child in that as much as I can. Um, if I can have sort of a playful intervention for that, then we'll do something playful even with the parent just to continuously build that connection because I never want to become the attachment figure for the child. I want that to remain to be the parent. So if there's things that, that the child is opening up about or talking about, then, then I want the parent to be in there for that. And I think that's really important. Um, more and more, I think research is following having the parent come into play therapy sessions with their child. And so that may be a trend that you see happening Interesting. Uh, in the future. But yeah, so they'll come in, we'll, we'll check in. Usually I have an activity, so it'll be a book that we'll read together mm -hmm. or we'll get the toys out and we'll play, we'll play with the toys for a little while. Things that I'm sort of directing. Mm -hmm. And then usually like the last 10 minutes or so, the child is able to do sort of just a little free space. Like we just kind of do whatever uh, they want to do, play with what they want to play with. Um, we'll check in with the parent at the end. And, and that's, that's kind of what it looks like. So I like to front load the parent and end load the parent. So like front load, here's what we're going to be doing today during my time, like my mm -hmm. time. And then at the end, here's what we did. And here's how I want you to help them to practice this skill over the week. Because one of the things I think is really important to know about therapy is, is it's kind of like going to the gym, right? So if you only go to the gym one day a week, you're not going to get the muscles that you want to get. you got to mm -hmm. practice. you got to keep going. Yep. And so you got to think of coming to therapy as sort of the check-in, like you're checking in with your, your coach or you're checking in, you know, this is how the week went. And then the rest of the week is actually the practice of whatever skill you're learning in there. Yeah, no, that is, that is great. Um, so much good information. Do you have any books or yeah. recommendations that you, that, you know, as a parent that we could look into and read some more? Absolutely. Yeah. So my favorite um, author for children's to for parents to learn more about children um, mm -hmm. is Dr. Daniel Siegel, okay. and he is a I'm going to get it wrong. He is like um, brain. He's a brain guru. That's what I'm going to call him. He's a he's a doctor. He's he's um, and he talks about the brain and he's able to take all the important stuff about the brain, all the like sciency doctor stuff, all those words, all those concepts that are just like too much for the average person, including myself, and sort of bring them into common language for parents to understand, for, for clinicians even to understand. Um, and this book has probably been pretty foundational for me as a parent, but also as a clinician. Um, so he kind of just describes like how the child's brain is working mm -hmm. and how you can how you can work along with the child's brain. So we were talking about regulation and dysregulation and those stages of development. Mm -hmm. He describes this a little bit more in this book and gives you some really handy concepts to work with the, both of those stages, like how to relax and enjoy the regulation and how to like dig in deep and do some work during the dysregulation. So this Good. book is a, is a go-to, uh, is a go-to book. Yeah. Awesome. Pretty easy. Um, and then for people, for kids, for parents who have kids um, in adolescence, he also writes um, Brainstorm, which okay. is the power and purpose of the teenage brain. Okay. This is the guidebook for adolescents. And I actually, this is probably, this might not be great news for people, but he says the adolescent mind is ages 12 to 24. Oh, so, doggy. <laughs> yeah. So you're not out of adolescence until you have like a 24 year old. So oh my goodness. There are some parents who are probably jumping back now into, oh my gosh, I'm parenting an adolescent still, even though my child is 20 or 21. <laughs> a couple more years to go. Um, 
But this book is phenomenal in terms of that same sort of thing. And the reason he named it Brainstorm is because at that age of like 12 or 13, mm -hmm. that's the time when your brain is is really having a storm. It's under construction more as more than it has ever been. And so um, that's why those adolescent years can just seem to be so rocky. And so this book is really helpful in terms of like, like the guidebook. Why is this going on? Here it is. And, and what should I do about it? He does a really great job of including all of that together. So okay. I would that's awesome. Yeah. All right, we will make sure that we um, include links for those books too. All right. Well, I think that concludes every question that I wanted to ask this yeah. morning. Um, so thank you so much for your time today, Vicki. We will include um, those books as well as ways to contact Vicki and her website. That way, if you have additional questions or want to see if you can get on her schedule, you can do so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.